Welcome to our weekly Sunday morning service here at Woodlawn Baptist Church. The scripture reading today is taken from John chapter 15. John 15. I'm going to start reading at verse 18. And I'm using the New International Version, the 1984 edition. Jesus said, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the, out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you, No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law, they hated me without reason. When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Lord, thank you for this. Your holy word, guide us now, teach us. Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Open Doors is a Christian organization that serves persecuted believers around the world. Maybe you've heard of Open Doors. It was started by a man named Brother Andrew. Uh, it's like Voice of the Martyrs. I noticed you have Voice of the Martyrs poster on your bulletin board out there in the hallway. Open Doors each year produces a world watch list in which it lists the 50 countries where it's most dangerous to follow Jesus. Uh, this is the uh, 2019 watch list. The uh, Lord's put it on my heart to pray through these 50 countries on a regular basis. In 2021, the top five countries where it's the most dangerous to be a Christian are North Korea, that's consistently number one on the list, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, and Pakistan. My, my wife and I have had the privilege in a, in a past year of visiting the country that's number 17 on the list. Uh, that's China. And we were able to, to worship uh, right in the capital city with believers in, in Beijing. It was a tremendous experience. According to Open Doors, in the last year, this past year, 340 million Christians are living in places where there are high levels of persecution and discrimination. 4,761 Christians were killed for their faith. 4,488 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked. And 4,277 believers were detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. Now, there seems to be growing opposition to the gospel right here in our own United States of America against the values, against the beliefs that we hold dear. But America is not one of the 50 countries that's on the watch list, actually far from it. We can be thankful for the measure of freedom that we still do enjoy. Jesus forewarned us in his upper room discourse to expect persecution. If you're a Christian, you should be expecting persecution according to the word of Jesus that he spoke here in John 14 through 17, this upper room discourse. Now we've been traveling through this discourse 
in these last weeks. In chapter 13, we saw that Jesus calls us to humbly serve one another and to sacrificially love each other in the body of Christ, the church. We saw in John 14, where he said, Let not your heart be troubled, and that the remedy for troubled hearts is believing the promises of God. Last week in John 15, we learned the secrets of being a, spirit, a uh, fruitful Christian, a fruit-bearing disciple of Jesus. He gives us those secrets in the parable of the vine and the branches. And today we're looking at the Christian's relationship to the world. This is at the end of chapter 15 and going on into John chapter 16. Jesus, as part of his upper room discourse, he's told them that he's going to be leaving them, and as part of his preparation of them for his departure, he warns them that they're going to be facing persecution. And what he says to them applies to us as well. You've probably heard the old saying, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. You heard that little saying? Well, that's what Jesus is doing. He's arming his disciples ahead of time by for forewarning them of what is to come. He doesn't want his disciples to be surprised by persecution, lest they turn back from following him. For example, look at John 16.1. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. You see, under the pressure of persecution, we might be tempted to give up our faith, but Jesus doesn't want that to happen. Look at verse 4 of chapter 16. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. See, when Jesus was with the twelve apostles, the brunt of the opposition came to him. He, he, was, he was the leader, and so the, the opposition, the persecution was aimed at Jesus. But once he left and returned to the Father, then the disciples would be more exposed to that persecution. So he emphasizes here how to be prepared for persecution. We can be prepared ourselves for any opposition, persecution that we might face by remembering the, the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples here in John chapter 15 and 16. I think a key word is remember. You'll see in verse 20, he says, remember the words I spoke to you. That's in 1520. And in 164, he says, remember. When that time comes, remember that I warned you. He wants us to remember certain things, and by remembering his words, his teachings, that will fortify us when a time of persecution comes. So first of all, we can, re we can be prepared for persecution by remembering Jesus' warning about the kinds of persecution Christians will face. The kinds of persecution that Christians will face. First of all, hatred. Look at verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The word hate appears seven times in these verses. Like a, kind of like a hammer blow. Jesus says the world is going to hate you if you're a follower of me. Hatred, an attitude of hostility, opposition, animosity. And this hatred, this attitude of hatred underlies all the other kinds of persecution that he mentions. In 1520, he specifically uses the word persecution. Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. On the other hand, if they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. So, persecution. You know, that word is a translation of a word that normally in the New Testament is translated pursue. To pursue or to persecute is the same original word in, in the Greek. And if you think about it, 
Persecution has to do with pursuit, harassing, chasing after, tracking down people whom you're opposed to. That's what persecution is all about. And Jesus says that's going to happen to believers as well. And then there's ostracism. Look at verse 2 of chapter 16, 16.2. 16, they will put you out of the synagogues. Put you out of the synagogues. Now, a lot of the original persecution came from the Jews because a lot of the original followers of Jesus were Jewish people. And when they became Christians, they were put out of the synagogues. Why, people have even been excommunicated from churches for the sake of Christ. That is, so-called churches. Put out of so-called churches because they wanted to be faithful to the Lord Jesus, the head of the church. And then finally, he mentions death itself at the end of verse 2 in chapter 16. A time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. So that's also a form of persecution that comes against Christians. Death itself. We have the example of Saul of Tarsus. He thought, before he became Paul the Apostle, he thought he was serving God by tracking down Christians and voting the death penalty against them. He thought he was doing that in service of God, just like Jesus said, in John 16, 2. So what Jesus warned us about here has come to pass down through the centuries, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. There are famous martyrs who have suffered loss of life for the faith. The first martyr was Stephen. The first apostle martyred was James, the brother of John. Polycarp, another early martyr. In the 20th century, there was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I don't know if you've heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but he was a, a German Christian under Nazism. He lost his life for the sake of Jesus Christ. Many of you perhaps are familiar with the five missionaries down in Ecuador mm -hmm. who lost their lives because they were trying to penetrate one of the tribal groups down there, the Huaranis in Ecuador. Ecuador. That was in 1956. That made the front pages of the newspaper and of, I believe it was um, Life magazine at the time. Chet Bitterman was a young man who lost his life in 1981 in Columbia. My wife knew him in Bible college. He's now with the Lord. And there are countless, countless people whom most of us will never know in this life, but will know in the next life, who have laid down their lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. Christians have been killed in the name of Yahweh, in the name of Caesar, in the name of Allah, in the, la in the name of Marx, Karl Marx, and even in the name of Christ. People have killed Christians in the name of Christ. It's sad to say. So how can we prepare for persecution? I say to you, according to Jesus, the first way to be prepared for persecution is to remember the warning that Jesus gives us of the kinds of persecution that will come to believers. You see, we, we ought not to be surprised when we're opposed for the cause of Christ. God hasn't lost control when persecution comes. He's still on the throne. In fact, when persecution comes, everything's right on schedule because he told us that this is, good, is what's going to happen. But you know, we're, we're tempted to be surprised. We, we, you know, why, 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 why would they, how come they treat believers like this? But Jesus said it would happen. So we ought not to be surprised. And one way to be prepared for it is to know this warning that Jesus has given to us. But why is it that the world will be so opposed to believers in Jesus Christ? Why will they treat Christians this way? 
And here's the second way to be prepared for persecution. By remembering Jesus' explanation of the reasons why persecution will come. Because he gives us the reasons why it's going to happen right here in this passage. I see three reasons here. The first is because we're identified with Christ. It's our identification with Christ himself that invites the persecution. Look at verse 18 again. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. You see, we're not going to ever encounter something that didn't happen to our Lord first of all. It hated him first. Look at verse 20. Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, the master, they will persecute you also, the servant of the master. You see, it's our identification with Christ that is one reason for our persecution. Down in 21, he says, it's because of my name. They will treat you this way because of my name. See, if you're ever opposed because of Christ, maybe a relative ridicules you, puts you down, maybe you lose a job, whatever it may be, it's not really you that they're against. It's Jesus that they're against. So don't take it personally. The opposition is really against the Lord himself. <clears throat> But we're identified with him, and so that's why it spills over onto us. You remember on the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to Saul there and the great light, and he, and he fell to the ground? And what did Jesus say to him? He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Me. He was persecuting Jesus? Why, Jesus was up in heaven. But no, he was persecuting Jesus by persecuting the body of Jesus on the earth. He was persecuting the church. You see, it's our identification with Christ that's the reason for our persecution. If we are never persecuted, never opposed by others because of our faith, we ought to ask ourselves the question, how closely am I really identified with Christ? Because according to Jesus, if we're identified with him, we'll be treated as he was treated. Yeah. 2 Timothy 3.12, the Apostle Paul said, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Let me read that again. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's what Paul said. All! who identify with Christ. Now here's a second reason why we will be faced with persecution. Because we are alienated from the world. What do I mean by that? Look at verse 19. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. You see, as Christians, we're no longer part of the world. Jesus has chosen us and called us out of the world to belong to him. And so there's a sort of an alienation between us and the world, and that's one of the reasons why Christians suffer persecution. We're just different, says the Lord. We pose a threat to the world. A Christian's lifestyle is an implied accusation against the world that the ways of the world are evil. You never have to say a thing. But if you live a Christian life and you're a light in a dark place, the, the world doesn't like that. That's why they crucified Jesus. They had to put out the light. Because Jesus, by his life and by his words... He was a constant accusation to the evil of the world. In the very early days of Christianity, the Roman historian Tacitus said 
that the pagans charged the Christians with, quote, hating the human race. So the early Christians were accused of hating the human race, even though they were trying to do good to the human race. Christians often are made out to be the bad guys when we're trying to be the good guys for the sake of Christ. Here's another question to ask ourselves. If we don't ever suffer any persecution, any opposition, any ridicule because of Christ, is it because we're too much like the world? You see, Jesus called us out of the world to himself. But if we're too much like the world, then the world will never be opposed to us. We'll just, we'll just fit right in. Here's the third reason. Because the world is ignorant of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says that over and over again in these verses. The world is ignorant of the Father and the Son. Look at 1521. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. They, they do not know God the Father. Look at 16, 3, chapter 16, verse 3. They will do these things because they have not known the Father or me. So people of the world who turn against Christians don't know the Father and don't know the Son whom he has sent. You see, the Son, Jesus, is a revelation. He's the perfect revelation of the Father. So people who oppose Jesus are also opposed to God because Jesus is the revelation of God. So, how can we prepare for persecution? One way is by remembering Jesus' explanation for the reasons for persecution. We're identified with Christ whom they crucified we're alienated from the world. We're just different because we belong to Jesus and not to the world. And the people who persecute don't really know the Father or the Son. Now, knowing these reasons, I think, can help us when the time of persecution comes. Uh, per persecution is going to be difficult and hard no matter what, right? No, no one likes to be opposed. No one likes to be taunted. Can you imagine what... It, what it felt like for Jesus when he was on the cross, when he was with the Roman soldiers, when he was before the Sanhedrin, and they, they just endlessly taunted him. That's kind of hard to take, isn't it? But if we can recognize that there are reasons why this is happening, our identification with Christ, our alienation from the world, the fact that the people who are taunting don't know God, they don't know Jesus, that's why this is happening. So I can make some sense of it, is the idea here. We can also prepare ourselves for persecution by remembering Jesus' verdict on the guilt of the persecutors. By remembering Jesus' verdict on the guilt of the persecutors. This is in verses 22 to 25. Look there. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. I think he means not guilty of the sin of rejecting God and rejecting his son. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. The persecutors have no excuse for their sins, says Jesus. Because I've come and I've spoken the truth to them about God, about myself. And so they, they could have known the way. They could have become followers of Jesus themselves. But they rejected me. They rejected the Father. There's no excuse for their sin. But not only Jesus' words, also his works. Oh, by the way, verse 23 says, He who hates me hates my Father as well. Those who reject my words, they hate me. They hate my Father as well. But now he talks about his works. 
If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. See, they heard Jesus' words, they saw his works, his, his miracles, and yet they hated him and they hated his father. But there's no excuse because Jesus has revealed God to us through his words and through his miracles. He says in verse 25 that all of this fulfilled all Old Testament prophecy. This is to fulfill what was written in their law. They hated me without reason. Why, it was said back in the Old Testament. I could find four times in the Psalms where it said that God's Messiah would be hated for no reason. That is, no justifiable reason. It just doesn't make any sense. God sent His Son to be the Savior of the world, and yet they hated Him, even though He came to reveal God to them. So how can we prepare for persecution? By remembering that Jesus said that the persecutors will be held responsible for their wrongdoing. You see, they have rejected Jesus' words, they have rejected his works, they've rejected God. So, let me say this to you. If you're ever opposed by others because of Christ, maybe it's from a relative, maybe it's a neighbor, and don't start second-guessing yourself. Maybe I'm on the wrong track. Maybe this way is too narrow after all. Maybe I ought to get in step with the world like everybody else. No, don't, don't let the devil convince you that you're on the wrong path if you're following Jesus. Because those who oppose you, they are guilty of not realizing that Jesus is who he said he was and that his works show that he is the Savior sent by his Heavenly Father into this world. He has given convincing evidence by what he said and by what he did that he is the one that we ought to follow. So whether it's kids at school, whether it's neighbors, whether it's your co-workers, don't let them put you down in a way that causes you to doubt your faith in Jesus Christ. Do you know that the scales of justice will at last be balanced in the end? I just want to read this to you. You don't have to turn to it. In Revelation, when Jesus is opening the seven seals, maybe you remember that? When he opens the fifth seal, this is John's vision up in heaven, he said, John said, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? How long are you going to let this persecution go on? He says, they say, the, the martyrs. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had, had been completed. So the martyrs who have, who have gone ahead of us, they're told, be patient a little longer until your number is complete and then the scales of justice will be balanced. The righteous will be rewarded, and those who have rebelled and have not repented from their rebellion, they will at last receive their judgment from God. So, hang on, friends. Remember what Jesus said, what his verdict is on the guilt of the persecutors. And here we come to my last point this morning. We've been talking about how to be prepared for persecution. 
And I suggested by remembering Jesus' warning about the kinds of persecution that we'll face, his explanation of the reasons why, his verdict on the persecutors, and now here's the last point. We can prepare for persecution by remembering Jesus' promise of help in facing persecution. He promises to help us. In fact, he promises a helper, a helper to be with us even through our persecution. And who am I talking about? I'm talking about the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Look at verses 26 and 27 of chapter 15. Isn't it interesting that in this passage, this kind of dark passage about persecution, right in the middle of it, Jesus drops this teaching about the Holy Spirit. Verse 26, when the Counselor comes, some translations say the Helper, the Comforter, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. He promises that the Holy Spirit will come, and he will bear witness of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit will help us who are also bearing witness of Christ, and maintaining our testimony even in the face of of opposition. Now, I like the way this is expressed in 26 and 27. Do you realize that the primary witness to Jesus Christ is not you and me, it's the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. You see, our job as witnesses for Jesus is to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. You see, that, that's, what, uh, that's what Andrew was doing this week on the job. He prayed spiritual garden, God heard that prayer and opened a door. Andrew told me over the phone this week that he never had such a conversation with a co-worker as he did this week. You see, the Holy Spirit was going ahead and preparing the way and opening the door. He's the primary witness. Our job is to cooperate with him and bear witness in the power of the Spirit. Now, the apostles were the first human witnesses working with the Spirit. That's what he says in verse 27. You also, speaking of the apostles, must testify, for you've been with me from the beginning. You see, the apostles were right there at the start of Jesus' earthly ministry. But they've passed the torch to us, friends. And we have that same Holy Spirit living in us and empowering us to share the good news about Jesus with others. So we also are to testify of Christ in our time, here in the 21st century. And then there's another way that the Holy Spirit is our helper in this passage. And now I'm skipping down in chapter 16 to verse 7. Look there. I tell you the truth, said Jesus, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor, the helper, the, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, unless I go away, he will not come to you but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. You see, not only will the Holy Spirit help us in our witness for Christ, but he's out there convicting the world, the unbelieving world, convicting the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, Jesus said. He goes on to explain that in the following verses. Verse 9, in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness, because I go to the Father, where you can see me no longer, in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world, the devil, now stands condemned. I can't uh, take a long time to explain that passage here this morning. But I heard a great sermon on it on one occasion. The Holy Spirit convicts people of the gravity of sin, that is the seriousness of sin, of our sin, the possibility of righteousness because Christ is righteous and his sacrifice on the cross 
has been approved by the Father, and he's been received back into heaven at the Father's right hand, and the certainty of judgment. And how do we know that, that judgment is certain? Because judgment has already fallen on the evil one, the prince of this world, Satan. His judgment began at the cross. That was D-Day as far as the devil was concerned. That's the turning point. Now, later on, he's going to be thrown into the abyss, and then even after that, he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire forever. Mm -hmm. But all those who do not trust in Jesus Christ will join him in that lake of fire, the Bible says in the book of Revelation. So the Spirit's job is conviction, conviction of the world. This happened on the day of Pentecost. Do you remember? Peter got up and preached that sermon on the day the Holy Spirit came. And the people, after they heard his sermon about Jesus, they said, what will we do? They were in anguish because they realized that they had crucified their own Messiah. They came under conviction. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. And they put their faith in Jesus. They repented, believed, and got baptized that very day. Are you familiar with Luis Palau, the Argentine evangelist? He passed away this week at the age of 86. The Argentine-born immigrant to the U.S. was one of Billy Graham's most prominent successors and spread the gospel in more than 80 countries around the world, leading millions to make a decision to follow Jesus. Palau, he, he spoke here in Providence just two or three years ago. I, I heard him speak. In fact, my wife were, and I were at a luncheon that earlier that day and got to sit at the same table with Louis, Louis Palau. And what was most impressive about him was the interest that he took in me and my wife personally. This guy had spoken to millions. Palau had a global ministry preaching the gospel to heads of state in Latin America, former communist countries as the Iron Curtain fell, and in the United States where he spent his adult life. Throughout his career, he called Christians to commit to the Great Commission. Now listen to this. This is why I'm sharing this with you this morning. Here's a quote from Luis Palau. Quote, The Holy Spirit said he would convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, said Luis. Do you believe it? I believe it, said Luis Palau. And that's why he preached for decades. Because he believed that the Holy Spirit was going ahead of him, convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So he wasn't afraid to preach and proclaim Christ, no matter what kind of opposition might come, negativism, because he was relying upon the work of the Holy Spirit. So, friends... When we bear witness of Christ, we can be sure that we're working together with the Holy Spirit. He's right there beside us, empowering us, help. He's actually the primary witness, as I said before. And we just need to get on board with him as we share the good news of Jesus with others. And he'll be right there beside us, convicting people of their sin, of the possibility of righteousness through faith in Christ, and of coming judgment if they do not believe. I want to close by just reminding us to be praying for the persecuted church. That's the way I started out this morning. There are brothers and sisters right now in our world who are facing great opposition because of their faith in Jesus. And Hebrews 13.3 says, Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Let's bow in prayer, please. Our Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we take a moment to remember our brothers and sisters in other places. I think of Hong Kong right now, which is under uh, increasing restrictions of their freedoms from the national government on the mainland and I'm sure this is negatively impacting many believers in the Lord Jesus Christ Lord give them boldness despite 
persecution, to bear witness of Christ. May the Holy Spirit be at work there to convict people of their sin and righteousness and judgment. And Father, we pray right now for a new filling of the Holy Spirit ourselves. Give us boldness. Thank you for what Jesus has done for us in dying for our sin and rising again from the dead. May we not be ashamed to bear his name. We ask this in our Savior's name. Amen. If you would like more information about anything you've heard today or inquire about online giving, you can reach us online at www.woodlawnri.org. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.